diversify your bonds. Hey guys, we're aliens. It's not about eating a good sandwich, you know, it's about the people there. That's what's more important. You can't live your life to the fullest if you don't have memes. That's a, be careful. Sometimes you gotta take the plunge and just, you know, go for what you love. As long as I like it, and then not just dance to it. Well, if I want to be successful, people gotta know me. Alright, keep that same energy. I love you, baby. I love you, baby. I love you, baby. What's up, sponsors? I hope you are sponsoring uh, the small YouTube channels out there. We are Please Don't Sue Us. Welcome. Um, so today, uh, we have in the house me, I am Ordeed. We have Angelo, the certified dad bod. We have Uncle Migs. And today, we have, and please, pl please... Uh, forgive me for destroying this name, but Gwitty Will, right? Yeah, yeah, that works. <laughs> Gwitta and Will. But yeah, that's close enough. She is a <laughs> Let's Player and YouTube personality. And uh, so we're going to talk about some cool things, get into maybe some tabletop talk, and uh, uh, talk about uh, Bloodborne lore. Uh, <laughs> like, like one does. <laughs> uh, but before we get into it today... Uh, let's have a word from our sponsor. Hello, Watchers. This sponsorship is brought to you by WatchMojo.com. Not really. Today, we will be doing a speed run for the top five podcasts of all time. Coming in at number five, we have Pliss Don't Sue Us Podcast. They, they are, they're a really good podcast, and you should check them out. Number four. Number four is the PDSU. Uh... I, I'm not exactly sure what that stands for, but they are a very good podcast, and you should check them out. Number three. Hosted by the NorCal Bonobos themselves, the Deeds of Another Pliss and Pliss Don't Sue Us podcast, uh, they, they, have a very, uh, they have a very interesting podcast. And, uh, yeah. Uh, number two. Number two, the PSU Radio. Uh, th this is the podcast hosted by none other than the Certified Dad Bod and Uncle Migs, and you should check it out. Number one, the Pliss Don't Sue Us podcast show show. This is, without a doubt, a factual opinion that this is the best podcast to ever exist, and you should check them out. That's all for today on WatchMojo.com sponsorship commercial. Not really. I yeah. love the, the sponsors we keep getting. They are getting more and more creative, and they're throwing more and more money our way every single time. So if you if you haven't picked out the the color to your Super Caria Angel, I recommend that you start picking <laughs> that out. Honestly, I'm thinking <laughs> cherry red. <laughs> Not red, cherry, cherry red. It's a classic for a reason. Exactly. Ooh, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to go with like a 1974 cherry red firebird. Okay, that's the dream car there right go. there. Okay. There <laughs> I respect people that already have the car picked out because that's you know that's a level of just knowing what you want. See, I have a car picked out, but I have a car picked out because I'm a super nerd. It's a 1967 Chevy Impala because supernatural is a thing. <laughs> oh, oh, the classics. Perfect, <laughs> One for the classics. Awesome, awesome. Well. We have you today, Gui Will. We're going to talk about what you do on YouTube and the games that you play. And one of the games that uh, I know that you play that I've had uh, some experience after watching a lot of the videos that you have on there currently is uh, your experience with the Bloodborne franchise. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, I, I played a little bit of this game. I know Angel's played a lot more than me. Um, <laughs> but to see the gameplay and actually have someone know what they're doing <laughs> is awesome because I did not know what I was doing. I died a lot. That's why, like, I stopped playing the game. But, <laughs> but I guess it's like, uh, when did you start uh, Bloodborne, and uh, why did you fall in love with it? Like, talk about the... uh, so that. That story is actually twofold. So I started playing Bloodborne because in October of I think it was 2017, it was the it was one of the free games you get with PS Plus. And I, I was a PS Plus member, and I was like, the free stuff. I like free stuff. Let's get free stuff. And I struggled with it. I struggled 
hard with Bloodborne. Like, because I'd never played a Soulsborne game of any type. I'd never played Demon Souls or Dark Souls, any of those. And so, like, learning that this game will punish you for every mistake that you make was really hard for me. Um, but then my brother swooped in because my brother has been a huge fan of all of the From Software games for a really long time and was like, let me help you. <laughs> let, let me show you how to play this game. And, and he helped me, and ever since, I've just I've loved the environmental storytelling that you find in From Software games. I, I love Bloodborne because I think Bloodborne has the most interesting combat options of any of the Soulsborne games. Uh, the, the parry and repose system is a little more gratifying to me than in other sis other games. I just, I, mm. I love it. Okay, that aggression system where you have to like fight them and get your health back, you know, keep the momentum of the battle yep. going versus in other Souls games, I do feel like there is that moment where you're like, okay, let me run, try to like Estus blast myself and like try to recover. Yeah, let me get this away. this one is like constant. Yeah, no, this, <laughs> if you are not going in, you better have a really good reason why you're not going in. Because not going in is going to get you killed. So I've, I've played uh, Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, and I beat all three of those. Uh, I haven't, like, played Sekiro. I haven't played Demon Souls because fuck that game. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, Bloodborne, for whatever reason, I could not get. I, I mean, I can, like, do, like, I, I like zipping around and doing a whole bunch of stuff like that. But I play too defensively. I'm rolling away a lot, and I have, like, the shield just in case all the time. And you don't have a shield in, in Bloodborne. If you get hit, you, you're just fucked. So, like... Mm -hmm. And it's, it's because there is a, a core difference in gameplay design there. In, in Dark Souls, don't get hit. That's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> just don't get hit. Roll, block, do something. Don't get hit. In Bloodborne, get hit and then hit them back twice as hard so you can get your health back. It, it's a core gameplay design difference that, that I really like. Honestly, I feel like that makes the boss fights more gratifying because, like, they're slightly more intense every single time. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, what's it called in uh, the first uh, Dark Souls? Uh, it's the uh, it's the two of them. It's the big golden guy and... Uh, Orange Scene and Smoke. Orange Scene and Smoke. That one is very similar to uh, Bloodborne fights because you have to constantly be in it, okay, the entire time. But I feel like other bosses in the Souls universe don't really capture mm -hmm. that feeling versus every single boss in Bloodborne hits you with that every single time. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, it makes it harder, but every like after every single boss, you're like, yes, I did it, they're dead, finally. It took me like <laughs> freaking three weeks or whatever, however long it took. <laughs> well, I, I get the same high off of first trying a Bloodborne boss that I get mm -hmm. off of having spent a week on a Dark Souls boss. And it's yeah. because every fight feels incredibly high stakes because I have mm -hmm. to be in all the time. There is no take a breather. Like I just, mm -hmm. I just did um, in the latest video that just went up this past um, Thursday, I did uh, Watch Dogs of the Oboards, which is one of the Chalice Dungeon mm -hmm. bosses. Never fought mm -hmm. that boss before in my life. Managed to do it first try, which is awesome. But I like that is awesome. I yeah. shouted to the point that my wife texted me from the other room to be like, "Did you hurt yourself? Are, are you okay?" <laughs> because it was just it was so gratifying. It like it mm. felt so good to do. So would you ever uh, like uh, get into Sekiro or something like that? Because uh, I don't think uh, you don't have Sekiro on your channel. And uh, uh, we haven't really talked that all about Sekiro. Uh, I love Sekiro. Uh, oh. the, I, like, I've played it, I've beaten it, I've gotten all of the endings for it. I, I love that game. Um, and I might... I've been thinking about what I'm going to do after I wrap up uh, Bloodborne and Final Fantasy, the, the two series that I'm running right now. I'm kind of torn between Dark Souls or Sekiro as the next one. Um, I love that game. But the thing that I know a lot of people don't, particularly a lot of Souls fans don't, and it's because it's not a, it's not really a Souls game. 
Mm-hmm. It, it's designed differently. The challenges to that game are different from the challenges that you face in Soulsborne games. It's designed like Tenchu was back in the day as a stealth ninja game. Mm-hmm. And there isn't a lot of stealth in the Souls games. So, like, the best way to play Sekiro, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, like, play games however you want to play the game, so long as you're having fun and not hurting anybody who cares. But in my opinion, the best way to do it is to sneak up and backstab every enemy you possibly can. But that that's how I like to play Sekiro. And so if I, if I do a Sekiro playthrough, which I might, I probably will actually because I really do love that game and I started playing it again recently because I got <laughs> I got bored. Uh, I it will be a lot of me talking about the environments and talking about the audio design while I sneak stealthily towards samurai to stab them. <laughs> cool. So uh, it sounds like you have a lot of experience with uh, uh, not only, uh, well, we've, we've t- uh, mentioned that you are uh, experienced in sound design, but it almost sounds like you're like experienced in game design as well, just game design in general. Um, I don't know that experienced is the right word. There is something in my personality that when I really enjoy something, I want to learn about it, and I, and I want to learn everything I can about it. So I have always, since I was a really little kid playing Marble Madness and Castlevania Simon's Quest with my dad, loved video games. And so I've always wanted to learn more and more about, like, how are video games made? How do they decide where to put enemies? Why did they put this enemy here instead of there? Why is the lighting this way? Why did they make the sound this way? Because I, like, that's just part of my personality is I get obsessive about things. And so... I got obsessive about video games, and so now I, I've learned a lot about game design because I love games. But I've never actually like, I've never like taken a course. Like there are courses in game design that you can take and things like that. I've never, I've never tried to implement that outside of being a, a GM for tabletop games. So I, I wouldn't necessarily call myself an expert, but. Uh, a impassioned amateur. I think I could go with that. <laughs> okay. Well, it sounds to me like you try to understand what you like about the games that you like. That's what it seems like. You're like, I like this game for this reason or that reason. You can like kind of put like sometimes you don't know why you like or not like something, so to put like a you know a reason why really helps to like just be like, oh, that's why I like the game. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. It's the same thing in wine. It's like, why do I like this wine, not that wine? Well, this one's, you know, this one's got more tannin, this one's less tannin, this one's more acidic, so on. Same thing. Or with um, um, with scotch. Uh, do, do you like it? Because it's smoky. If you like smoky scotches, you're going to want to drink more of these kinds of scotches. Do you like it because it's crisp, if you like crisp scotches? Like, wine and scotch are actually way more similar than I think people give them credit for. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and, to, and to compare that to games too, and just be like, this is like you know the game was designed this way. Like you were talking yeah. about uh, Dark Souls being like, like, don't get hit, or where it's like hit and attack again. Like just thinking about those things. Is, no, I yeah, I like to do that too. So <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> but um, speaking of your experience with uh, with sound design, so you mentioned sound design. Um, what projects have you worked on? Um, and like with with sound design and then also maybe talk about um how if someone wants to get into sound design like how do you get into it like you know it's from a like small content creator perspective like we're not at the studios we're not making we don't have a whole yeah. team of um, music producers or, or audio producers like how, how do you sure, do that sure um so uh my experience with sound design starts when i was about eight years old my my I, this is another thing i owe to my dad um, he was the uh, technical director for the local community theater group. So I grew up in the theater watching him and then learning how to do the things he did to try and like help, basically. Um, and that's where I started learning about sound design and how to mix sound. Um, most of my audio design, most of my sound design stuff has been live sound. I've worked professionally as a live sound engineer for 16 years before I left because I hurt my back and I couldn't do the load-ins anymore. 
Um, mm-hmm. So that's just like, that's my background in sound design. I love it. And so I learned a lot about it because I learn a lot about the things that I love. Um, yeah, yeah. If <laughs> if somebody wanted to get into sound design, there, there are a couple of tips I would have. The first one is Audacity is a wonderful free program that you can download and mess around with sound, mess around with EQs, mess around with effects. Because a lot of that, in my opinion, a lot of the best audio engineers and sound designers on the world, in the world rather, just play with it until it sounds right. Like when you when you read it, uh, interviews with them, things like that. How did you get this sound to sound this way? I don't know. I just messed with it until it sounded right. <laughs> like, <laughs> sounds simple enough. <laughs> but like, that is one of the first steps. Is just start doing it, mm-hmm. and you'll get better and better and better the more you do it. Um, right. The second big tip I would suggest is pick up a book on frequencies, on on audio frequencies, or not even a book necessarily. There are tons of YouTube tutor- tutorials that talk about audio frequencies. Um, there's tons of resources, but if you want to make really top quality sound design, one of the best things that you can do is understand what frequencies, what you're trying to produce live in, so that you can understand what frequencies you can get rid of, what frequencies you need to highlight, things like that. So like, for instance, with my, my YouTube videos, I know that the parts of speech that make us understandable live in a certain frequency range. So for the audio for my game, I take those frequencies out of the, the game audio. And those frequencies mm-hmm. ranges are so small that you would almost never notice that I've taken those out, but it makes me much more understandable because my consonants and my syllables come through clearer. So, okay. so learning more about where sounds live in audio frequency terms is, is the second thing I would say. Besides from that, you just gotta do right. it. You just gotta do it, mess around with it till it sounds right. There we go. Tips and tricks. Just keep doing it. And I, I think that's something that uh, people, you know, when they first start off, that maybe they don't realize is that like the only way to get better is to keep doing it. Um, so keep doing it. <laughs> like you will get better. Yeah. And I got lucky because like I didn't really have a choice. My dad had to be at the theater. My mom was at work. There was nowhere else for me to be and nothing else for me to do. <laughs> I got lucky. Best way to learn. So just do it. Full immersion. And the yeah. best part about sound design is that it's applicable to almost anything. Oh, yeah. Oh, for real. Uh, music. You, you can apply it to freaking video games. You can apply video it games. to streaming. To like, Oh, yeah. Anything. Yeah, I think a perfect example is Bloodborne because like the ambiance music of the entire game gives this like sense of dread that like perfectly pairs with the gameplay design, with the story. Like Everything is perfectly melded oh, together. Yeah. And I think yeah. that it's incredible that they were able to match those like elements together so flawlessly. Yeah, yeah. I it think. Is super uh, but yeah, I think those kinds of uh, uh, games, as well as like movies, like because Bloodborne is kind of almost a horror game, mm-hmm. and like a lot of uh, uh, the horror genre is. I, I know is I built. tag it as horror on my channel, so I hope it yeah, is. Yeah, it's, it's the, <laughs> the sound. The I sound hope it's a horror game. is what makes things scary and makes things intense it's, in my opinion it's because we react so viscerally to sound um, even people who are um, deaf or hard of hearing react viscerally to the vibrations that sound give off it's coded into our genetics from a time when we as a living being on the planet had to be afraid of their predators mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. exactly mm-hmm. yeah that's some deep shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember who, uh, who believed this, but there was a uh, like a musician from like a very very long time ago, like classical era, and he believed that music was like a part of like human beings, like the the vibrations mm-hmm. with the atoms and in, in people, or like. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that music? It, it is literally a part of us, kind of a thing. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't science too good, but <laughs> I thought that was uh, uh, I thought that was an interesting uh, perspective on it, especially from uh, a source 
so old. No, I would absolutely. Mm -hmm. Honestly, like yeah. a master of sound design can actually use that theory and make you feel things. Uh, you you can feel more visceral emotion from sounds than you can from actually seeing or hearing the natural like effects of it. Like, um, what's that movie about the guy who's uh, pinned to a rock for like a couple of days and he has to like, saw his hours. arm out? That's the one. That one, half the sounds in there are like really high pitched like frequency, like when like he's first touching the tendons, like you hear a metallic sort of like screech and stuff. So there's a bunch of these effects that aren't actual natural sounds. It's not it doesn't sound like him digging it out, but it feels even more visceral than seeing it and hearing it naturally would. And the sound designers of the movie knew that. They understood that there's only so much that our mirror neurons and our brains can really like we can only experience so much of it, like of the experience. Uh, without going through it ourselves, but that extra sound makes it, us get even closer to that level. Yep. And I think that the fact that they understood that and executed it so perfectly just shows just like the the extremes of where good sound design can get you. I would absolutely agree. Yeah, the, it, like mm -hmm. good sound design can make or break almost any project. It can it can make a project transcendent in a lot of different ways and and mm -hmm. one of the sounds that in bloodborne is like that to me is the sound where you land a visceral attack and i know i've talked about this on my channel because it's such mm -hmm. a good sound it is crunchy but it's got some high pitched some high pitched frequencies to it so it feels satisfying like you just did something awesome but it also mm -hmm. feels horrifying and the first time i the first time i did it i i was like wait a second why do i feel so bad about that because i feel great about it and that's another perfect thing because technically in bloodborne you're the bad guy everyone you interact with is worse off because of your interactions with them yep um like, yeah, really? no, for real, like, <laughs> the only way to have a happy ending in bloodborne is to not interact with anyone Exactly. <laughs> it's to not play the game. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you are looking for a happy ending, Bloodborne is not the game for you, my friend. <laughs> so kind of moving onwards, um, one of the things that um, we understand that you're uh, really into and hopefully you can uh, talk to us a bit about is um, kind of your experience uh, with role-playing games uh, such as uh, Pathfinder and the like, mm -hmm. and Maybe just share some funny uh, stories from that, because uh, um, we, like uh, uh, me and Angel, we play uh, roll-top tabletop games, and we just like talking about that, so talk about something that, that, you, yeah, yeah. that you've uh, experienced doing that. Um, I love tabletop role-playing games. I've, I've been playing them for years at this point. I started playing with D&D 3.5. Um, I have a lot of stories spanning from my first character who was a, a half-orc fighter who had fought his way into being a, a city guard for the city that my GM had set the campaign in um, and was trying to, to single-handedly change the way that people view orcs all the way <laughs> all the way up to this last Friday we my group just played a game that I GM'd where I opened it up with the classic, all right, so this is the setting. This is what we did last week. What do you want to do? And one of my players said, I would like to pillage a farmstead. <laughs> I mean, goals. Okay. I mean, you are a level 10 barbarian, my dude. You can pillage a farmstead. But uh, I, I would like to remind you that the, uh, the country that you are currently in, 20% of the population is giants. <laughs> and there are giant guards on patrol so if you get caught it's not going to go well <laughs> they're like I acknowledge <laughs> pretty much, continue. It's pretty much what happened <laughs> uh, springboarding off of that uh, do you enjoy more mechanically like complex games or do you think that uh, tabletop games with like more simplified uh, games are in your personal preference like better that is a hard question to answer and and the reason why that's a hard question to answer for me and, and this is going to sound a little bit like a cop-out but i swear it's not is i i think it depends on what you're trying to accomplish like mm -hmm. 
so my current game is Pathfinder Second Edition. That's that's a really crunchy game. But we're playing it because when my friends approached me and said, "Hey, would you run a game?" I said, "What kind of game do you want to run?" And they said, "We want to kill monsters in a medieval high fantasy magic setting." And I said, "Cool." Pathfinder 2nd Edition has the perfect rules for that to make combat feel satisfying and to do all of those things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Compared to when I had friends wanting to play a game but they didn't really know what they wanted to play, they're just like, I don't know, I just mm -hmm. want to play. Or, Can you please just run a game? Mm -hmm. And I was like, sure. So I pulled out Fate Core, and together we put... To That's the great thing about Fate Core is you build mm -hmm. the whole thing together so together we put together exactly the sort of game they wanted to play it, it's interesting it, it's hard <laughs> to say that i prefer one over over another mm -hmm. because they all have all of the systems i've played have a special place in my heart because they allow me to tell mm -hmm. a story that i wouldn't be able to tell outside of that system Okay, that makes so, sense. I guess I, I, I guess what you're saying is there's different there's different games for different people. There's the crunchier games, which are ones with more rules, and then there's like the smoother games, the ones with less rules, and then there's even the games that you can almost put together depending on they're like, hey, well, you don't really know what you want, and here's a game that's great for people that don't really know what they want. Like, <laughs> yeah, they kind of, and it's all yeah. about. I think what makes it a tabletop role playing game great isn't necessarily the system. I think it's being on the same page with everybody in the group about what you want and what sort of story you want mm -hmm. to tell and then telling that story together. Okay. Now, that was since... beautiful. I like that. I want to like quote that. That's that's why you play tabletop is right there. <laughs> that, that reason. Exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh and uh, speaking of your friends wanted to play a high fantasy setting, why did you choose uh, Pathfinder versus um, some like D&D &D 5e or something? Did you find something in the mechanics that would uh, make it work better for that? Or do you think you just chose it because of like your personal preferences? So it, it's a little bit of both. It, it started mm -hmm. because... Uh, so I started in D&D in &D 3.5. And when mm -hmm. we had the the... I have heard some of my friends at the friendly local gaming shop call it the schism, but I think that's a little over dramatic. When you had Pathfinder <laughs> split off from Wizards of the Coast and do their own thing, when Wizards of the Coast went with Fourth, I went with mm -hmm. Pathfinder. And it wasn't okay. anything more complicated than that's what the group I was playing with was playing. That's, that's all mm -hmm. it was. So right. I just have way more experience with Pathfinder than I do with D and D at this point. That was the first. Oh, one. Okay. Um, but I did have one player that was like, hey, D&D uh, &D 5e looks really, really cool. Could you look at it and see if there's some, if it's something that we could do? Or do you want to just keep doing Pathfinder? And I said, absolutely. Because I think that if a player comes to you and is like, hey, this is a system I think is really cool. You, you owe it to yourself and to your players as a GM to at least look at it. And, and try yeah. and see if it will work um, okay and it just at that point it came down to 5e gives players a lot of very powerful options to deal with what the GM wants to throw at them that make creating challenging encounters more difficult in my opinion oh, okay um, so you feel it like it's harder easier. to balance the encounters yeah exactly oh, okay. That it's easier for me to balance the encounters in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, in my opinion. Um, it's also mm -hmm. easier, in my opinion, to fudge stuff in 2nd Edition. And and I'm not saying, like, fudging rolls, because I don't fudge rolls. But if my players are really mm -hmm. struggling, like, oh no, I probably shouldn't have thrown my group of level 8 characters at a Grave Knight, that was probably a bad <laughs> idea. Um, I, They don't know what the AC of that monster is. And it's not mm -hmm. easy to look it up. So I can fudge mm -hmm. it and be like, yeah, it's not actually 32, it's 25. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Okay, fair. I mean, yeah, when you're not looking to just be like, oh, <laughs> getting some player kills today. <laughs> <laughs> Man. There, there is a... There, 
that is a type of game that some people absolutely love to run. I am not one of those uh-huh. people. I, no. I, I want to tell a cool story with my friends. Mm-hmm. Killing a character, unless it's built up towards really carefully, just mm-hmm. slows that process down. That's true. If you have a character you're really attached and then the character dies, you're going to be like, oh, this, this sucks. Like, and then what does that do for the good. rest of the session? Build a new mm-hmm. character while everybody else is killing things and getting loot? Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like, if everybody in the party is cool with that and they're on the same page, that's great. If that's the game you want to play, that's awesome. That's not the game that mm-hmm. I run. That's mm-hmm. fair. Well, I think and, this is funny because uh, <laughs> I I know DM and uh, they're more comfortable with killing their players. <laughs> oh, I'll kill my players if they do something stupid or if they fail a roll. <laughs> like death is always an option. There are risks. Oh, okay. oh it's always on the table. <laughs> but I'm not going to. I'm not going to sit there and watch my friends spend four hours of their lives struggling to beat something when I'm the one who put it in the game when it probably shouldn't have been there. I'm mm-hmm. not going to do that. Fair right? enough. You have to account for everyone's pain level, you know? Like, when you're the DM, you're like, hey, how much pain am I throwing today? Like... <laughs> 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 and speaking towards your DMing, do you actually prefer being the DM, or uh, is that just something you, like, do sometimes? The answer to that question has changed so much over the last few years. Um... So I used to get really, really frustrated that I was the only one that mm-hmm. was willing to DM. And so I was I was mm-hmm. DMing because if I didn't, nobody else would. Okay, that makes sense. And then over the last couple of years, it's kind of changed. Mm-hmm. I love DMing. I, I, I love putting together a, a set of challenges and seeing how my players are going to approach it. Because they always mm-hmm. surprise me. They always come up with a solution <laughs> that I never would have expected. And and it's awesome every time. I love making characters. And I get to do that more mm-hmm. as a GM than I would ever get to do that as a player. Okay. I love role-playing characters. Same thing. I get to do that more as a GM than I ever got to do it as a player. So... Over the last couple of years, it's it's changed a little bit. At this point, yeah, I I think I am the GM because I want to be the GM. Okay, would you, would you say being a DM has helped you, you know, like get your creative juices flowing a little more than just being a character would? Yes. Yeah, I would absolutely. Oh, okay. Say that. Fair enough. I don't know that that's going to be true okay. for everyone, but I would say that for me, mm-hmm. yeah. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I like it. It's almost like at first you're like. This sucks. No one wants to be the GM. And then you're like, after a while, you like come to terms with it. And then you're like, nah, I'm the best GM. <laughs> it is, uh, it's the five stages of grieving. The five stages of being a GM. <laughs> uh, but yeah, speaking uh, again towards your, uh, your tabletop games, have you ever thought about streaming that onto your channel, like making that a, like a significant portion, or do you think that's more like a personal thing that you just like enjoy doing on the side? You wouldn't consider pursuing that in like a semi like, you know, professional degree. Cause like if you're streaming it, like at that point, you're like making a part of your channel and part of your income, you know right, what I mean? Right, right. Uh, I have thought about it. I've, I've thought about it a lot. Um, I talked with my current party about doing it with this game that I'm currently running, um, Mm -hmm. and it it just didn't pan out, and it it didn't pan out because of scheduling conflicts and getting everything, the stuff they would need to make it something that I'm proud of, because I'm torn. Mm -hmm. I I always want to be having fun on my channel, because I feel like Mm -hmm. if I'm not having fun, it's real obvious to everybody watching, and then they're not having Mm -hmm. fun. Mm-hmm. And and the main okay. thing I want to achieve with my channel is a place where people can be respected and have fun. That's what I want. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just didn't work out because the other side of that is I always want to look at what I've made and even if it's not perfect, mm-hmm. be proud of it. Be proud of what I did with what I had, with the knowledge that I had, all of those things. And it just wasn't the, the group wasn't in a position where we could make something that I was going to be proud of. So I pulled the plug. But 
we have talked pretty seriously about once this campaign wraps up uh, streaming our next campaign because they have decided that they like me enough to want me to give them another game after this one's <laughs> over. <laughs> oh, yes, and they, everybody's on board like, with they that. They like the pain. They want it back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody's on board with that. We're trying... <laughs> We're, we're throwing ideas around. We're still in the middle of the current campaign, so it won't be for a while. But uh, but once it happens, I will mm. definitely make an announcement, and it will most likely be streamed on Twitch. That will be fun. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I'm Honestly, nice. you'll have to tell me how you even get that set up, because I've been thinking about doing something like that. But like, like the problems that we've mentioned, finding a good GM that will put in the time uh, and then finding people that are willing to, you know, put themselves on stream is another thing yep. that I, at least I find difficulty sometimes with. Uh, but yeah, and then and then, then having an engaging campaign and, all, and then all the other stuff that comes with it. So if you figure that out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, that'd, that'd be awesome. That's awesome. I'll let you know yeah. what I figure out. I don't know that I'll figure all of that out. <laughs> I don't know that I'm <laughs> we're, that. We're all learning. <laughs> We're all learning. We're we're all in this together. <laughs> right. yeah. We we make each other better by sharing what we've learned. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, moving on, and this is probably the last big topic that we're going to talk about today. Uh, I wanted to bring this up because this is like kind of new YouTube news, but uh, the YouTube terms of service. This affects every like small content creator. Um, in some way, shape, or form. So, originally, when you would get, like, a thousand subscribers, uh, I think you had to have, like, a certain amount of watch time as well. Mm-hmm. They'll throw ads on your videos, and you'll be able to get monetized. And it's lit, because then you get, like, the cool $7 that you you made for your, like, hard work. You finally <laughs> right. paid for, uh, for having fun. And, and it would be, like, the first kind of big milestone. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of something that we were hoping to uh, shoot for within the next year, uh, was the, the thousand. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, YouTube said, fuck you guys. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, they, they, I believe they're just putting, they're going to put ads on their videos anyways, but they're just not going to pay people money. Um, so I wanted to know a kind of uh, uh, your opinion on that. And uh, as a small YouTube uh, and content creator, um, I, I I believe you're pretty new, but like, how are is this going to affect you, and how do you want to adapt? That is both a very good question and a very complicated question. Uh huh. And and I've honestly I've been struggling with answering that question for a few days now, uh, mm-hmm. a few weeks really. Um. And I still don't really know. I, I, on the one hand, I understand that we are in the Wild West period of online video still right now. Mm-hmm. And that at some point that's got to change because that is not fair to advertisers. It's not fair to content creators. It, it, it's not fair to the platforms. Like... YouTube has been losing money hand over fist for years now. So I I understand that something has to be done to make it fair and profitable for everyone in the arrangement. But on the other hand, it is incredibly... It's frustrating. And and I'm sure that you guys Mm -hmm. feel that as well. It's really frustrating to have a goal that you're working towards and then one day with almost no notice the goal post moves <laughs> and you have no control yeah. over it yeah. it's it's really frustrating um mm-hmm. i think as a small content creator and what i would suggest for other small content creators is remain positive i don't think youtube is out to screw us maybe they are and i'm naive but i don't think so i i think they're I, trying I, I would agree with you I think they're trying yeah. to build a, a fair, profitable platform for video content for everyone involved. And that's going to be mm-hmm. a painful process. So remain positive. 
try and be as communicative with the people who run YouTube as you can be. When you, when you see something you don't like, let them know via tweets, via mm-hmm. email messages, via whatever you want to use to get in touch with them. And when you see something that you do like that they're doing, let them know. Because that, that sort of balance of those two things is, I think, how we, we grow as a community into a place that's a mm-hmm. better place for everybody at large, but particularly for small content creators. Um, mm-hmm. The last thing that I'd suggest is, and this is going to sound a little crazy, but get involved in like what's going on with the FCC. Know who your representatives yeah. are. Even if you're not in the U.S., know who your representatives are that are in charge of internet content. They're in charge of things like YouTube. Mm-hmm. And tell them what you want to see. Because if, we, if we're if we open and honest with everyone involved about what we want to see for this platform going forward, I think there's going to be some growing pains. I think there are going to be some conflicts. There's going to be problems. But I think that that is mm-hmm. the only way we can make this a positive place for, for everyone that involved. That sounds about right. Yeah, I know Europe was trying to uh, get this ridiculous... Uh, sent, uh, what was it? It was like... They wanted to make sure that every single every single video on YouTube that was played in Europe had to have like go through this process where they didn't have any sort of um, uh, copyrighted music or something. Uh, but the problem was that they were just like, well, we're not going to think of a process. We're just going to take it down. And YouTube was str- I know the Internet was really struggling to try to get that thing stopped in the UN Parliament. Uh, I'm not really sure how it turned out, but. Uh, I, I know that politics plays a deep role in what happens on the internet because yeah. ultimately the internet can't survive with like if every government on earth collapses it can't survive without it so it needs the government and fundamentally is basically ruled over by the government Yep. so their regulations deeply affect everything that we do on this platform uh, and as for the ads themselves ultimately I think that we we should still communicate with them, but we should also wait and see what happens. Because if it's just like a banner, yeah. you know, at the bottom of the video, mm-hmm. it's not that bad. But if it's a full blown like 15, 30 second like commercial before like your video, that 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 adds an extra barrier to entry that I think that deeply hurts the small content creator community. Because like it's just that like you know it, people because people when they come to our videos they don't they just want to see our content and when right. we're small like this people expect to be able to just see the entire thing without any interruption. Uh, so I think that it could be deeply detrimental depending on how it's implemented. So I think there is a happy medium uh, that we can arrive to because, again, as you were saying, YouTube has been losing so much money. Basically, even before the adpocalypse a couple of years back, people have been pulling out of it for a while now. So they need to make money somehow and i'm i'm okay sacrificing some screen space for it but i don't know whether or not i'm willing to sacrifice whole segments of like time to mm-hmm. i i uh, agree i i think there's a happy medium that can be found and and i do think that right now we're in a little a little bit of a wait and see what happens with mm-hmm. this and and that's what i mean by by let them know if if we wait and mm-hmm. see and it's full 15 30 second ads on our on our videos that we're not getting any revenue for we should absolutely mm-hmm. be say we should be tearing down the walls saying hey this is not fair this is not cool if it's a banner ad man there are a lot of really great people that work at youtube not everybody that works at youtube is great just like not mm-hmm. everybody that works at google <laughs> or home depot or lowe's or any company is great but there are a lot of really great people that work at youtube and they've got to the the way that our systems work up work right now they've got to make money somehow so there's yeah. there's yeah. got to be a balance and I, I i just this is my two cents on that it's like you know just for youtube in general um i think it's also just in, in this day and age it's almost like being able to roll with that and adapt um, if YouTube is not your platform for whatever reason, um, there's other platforms now where you can 
still do the content that you like in a different way, whether it's streaming on Twitch or um, uh, Instagram, like uh, TikTok. There's there's like different forms of media. Yeah. Like you, you know, like you can always diversify from just doing the one thing and just like I said, like being able to adapt to whatever you have fun with. Yeah, so like, don't 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 go into a content or don't go into like a uh, a social media that you don't have like fun putting content for. But like that being said, like I mean for me it's like okay, uh, YouTube and like Instagram. Instagram you can still post videos there. Um, you can still post videos on TikTok. Like you know if that's a, your thing, like posting videos. Um, I mean post them on Twitch honestly. So like just considering the fact that you're not always boxed in just to YouTube. And to just always think bigger than whatever you're working on. I would agree. Yeah, the, like mm-hmm. being willing to, and and I know I didn't say this, but but I would absolutely agree. Being willing to, if you if you say, hey, this isn't fair, and nobody is willing to change it, your your two options there are well, your three options there are stay and keep fighting to change it, stay and don't fight to change it, just give up. Or leave, go to a different platform. I know that there are, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's there's a service called, um, what's it called? Crud. Nebula. It's, it's called Nebula. Um, and it's pretty much just educational YouTubers who got really frustrated with YouTube's policies for some of their videos. And so they made their own service, video hosting service. Oh, I think I have oh, heard I of that. Um, like, that's also an option. Not for everyone, obviously. Mm-hmm. But, like, mm-hmm. so far as adapting is concerned, I think stay and do nothing is not really an option. Uh-huh. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> yeah, I, I think your options are stay and try and make it better by trying to have open, honest conversations with the people that can affect change that you want to see. Or go somewhere else, even if that right. means making somewhere else. Because that's the great thing about the internet. Well, it does rely on the government to to continue running. It relies on the governments mm-hmm. rather to continue running. Mm-hmm. You can make basically anything on the internet. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I think those are some wise words. I, I uh, wholeheartedly agree with everything you're saying. I think we've had a good conversation thus far, and I just want to uh, bring it down to like kind of our the last question of the hour. Uh, you know, the one we always ask every podcast, <laughs> um, and, and that is, um, what are a few uh, small content creators that you enjoy? Um, if you know any or would like to talk about and we are focused on talking to small content creators and we always like to know more people so that we can maybe get in contact with them and they'll show up on the podcast. Uh, I mean you've already had one of them on, on the podcast. Swerve is is awesome. Yeah, Yellow Swerve is, is great. Uh, oh you know Yellow Swerve. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Miss Mika on uh, on Twitch is amazing. Um, she makes really, really cool Soulsborne content and a bunch of other stuff that she does on Twitch. She's super awesome. Um, Epic Name Bro isn't really a small content creator, but he kind of is because he lost a lot of his viewers when he left YouTube and went to, to Twitch only. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And he's rad. He's super cool. Um, mm mm-hmm. Who else do I watch that I absolutely love? Mm. Uh, uh, Zakail, Z A K A I L, is another um, Twitch streamer that I watch on a pretty regular basis. That is awesome. That has a really small community, but it's a really welcoming, fun community. He does the VTuber mm. thing, which I'm not sure I could ever do, <laughs> where he's got the <laughs> face rig set up and everything. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, the those are some of my favorite small content creators that are small to medium content creators, I guess. Yeah. That are, mm-hmm. that I really love. Awesome. Well, we'll have to check them out. And uh, if you haven't checked them out, check them out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> tell, tell us what you think. Uh, um, 
but yeah and then lastly uh goody will uh where can we find you where where your um, where do you post you know where, where do you create content uh so i am on youtube at werewolf games uh which is uh g-w-i-r-i-w-y-l-l don't know why i thought a welsh username was a good idea but now it's where people know to find me so <laughs> it's so unique you can't forget it it, it is incredibly <laughs> that, is that is true um i am on twitch at the same it's it's at where will um twitter is the same those are the three big ones that i use regularly i browse reddit but i don't post very often i mostly just browse <laughs> To be fair, that's that, fair. That's fair. I'm, I'm a hardcore Reddit lurker. But even on Reddit, it's the same username. It's it's the same everywhere. <laughs> to be fair, though. Perfect. <laughs> Yo, all right. So, uh, I think uh, that's gonna be that's gonna be everything today. Uh, you can find all of our links. Uh, we we have a lot of links. Uh, that more links than I can name off right now <laughs> down below. <laughs> um, a lot, a lot of links. Yeah. Yo, uh, we do have new merch up. So shout out to the new merch. Uh, wait, is that up yet? It will be. Uh, it will be. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you're listening to this, it is up. Check out the merch. I I got a sneak peek before we started recording. You guys want to check out this merch? It's it's awesome. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> It was done by, you know, my good friend Kate, who's also been on the podcast, and she does amazing artwork, and um, she did this logo for us, and it, it looked awesome. I, I love wearing t-shirts that just, you know, support what we do, and if you want to do the same, like, we appreciate it because we love doing this for y'all, so. Um, but yeah, and other than that... Um, I think else? that's it. I hope you keep diversifying your bonds and the small YouTube channels, and thank y'all. For sponsoring us with your time. We don't think for legal reasons, content content we should mention that all sponsors are not actually sponsoring us. We only mention them for the sake of parody and all belief brands and intellectual properties are owned by respective companies and the content of this podcast is not reflect views or values of those in companies. Seriously, seriously. Please don't sue us. We have no money. I just realized what I would want. Mm-hmm. I want the ability to just not sue. Uh, imagine how much more productive it needs to be. Yeah, you spend like how how a third like, of your life. Time. Yeah, so, like, like a third of your life. So sixty years would be like twenty years of your life you spent sleeping. Yeah. And here's the other thing about sleeping: every single time you sleep, it's just a few shots. Yeah. You get sampled every <laughs> single time you sleep. And you know what sucks about that free trial? It's freaking good. Like <laughs> it's a good free trial. You want to like just make it permanent, and then you're like. <laughs>